The following set of video clips is a tour through several examples of ground penetrating radar applications for field studies. The objective is to show a variety of settings and measurement strategies related to successful acquisitions. We'll start off with a measurement of a permanent snowfield around 3,400 meters elevation. This snowfield is primarily driven by wind-driven uh, deposition as air is funneled through a saddle directly above the snowfield. Based on historical observations, it appears that low snow years followed by warm summers can result in a snowfield disappearing temporarily. Here we're working to measure how thick the snow is and look for any evidence of ice layers or other evidence of previous minimum snow years in the GPR data. You can see here, due to the steep and slippery nature of the snow surface, we pack the GPR into a sled and tow the antenna behind, all attached to a top rope okay. system. The operator okay. walks alongside Reset. the instrument to monitor progress and troubleshoot uh, if perfect. needed. Otherwise, the instrument is operating automatically. You can see the type of image we get from measuring a permanent snow field using GPR here. This radar gram can be interpreted in terms of current snow year, total snow thickness, and reflectors that indicate possible minimum snow field extents. Below the snow layer, you can see chaotic diffraction patterns that are due to the boulder and scree field. In the next example, we are measuring lake ice properties using multiple offset GPR acquisition. As carbon in lake sediments decomposes, gas is produced that rises through the water column and is trapped in the lake ice during the winter. The rate of gas escaping from the lake sediments is proportional to the amount of gas trapped in the ice. Therefore, by using GPR to calculate ice physical properties, we can back out the gas flux rate. This is particularly important in permafrost regions where the carbon may be from tens of thousands of years ago and is only now re-entering the modern carbon cycle due to climate change. We complement the multiple offset measurements with common offset measurements to measure the thickness of the ice along the distance of our transect. To make these multiple offset measurements, we use high frequency separable antennas and hold the transmitter at a fixed location and move the receiver in a common shot point gather style. You can learn more about these lake ice GPR measurements and the results of our work to develop relationships between gas trapped in ice and the GPR response in this paper here published in the Journal of Geophysics. And we're here out today in the snowy range of Wyoming and we're testing a multi-channel GPR and we're going to use this instrument uh, on lakes in Alaska to measure how much gas gets trapped in the ice um, from uh, carbon that's decomposing in the subsurface of the permafrost. To combine the advantages of common offset imaging and multiple offset velocity measurement, we can use a continuous multi-channel acquisition mode. The two antennas here transmit signals between them in four configurations, thereby producing an abbreviated common shot gather type measurement at each position across the lake. The antennas are triggered every half a meter based on the distance wheel attached to the assembly. Here's an example where we towed the GPR by dog sled to cover a bit more ground. One of the advantages to GPR is the fast speed that the traces are measured at. Generally, the data quality does not suffer if the antennas are moving up to several kilometers per hour, particularly with a shallow reflector like ice thickness. Sometimes when we want to cover much longer distances, we attach the GPR to a vehicle. 
In the winter, snow machines work well for this. The position is recorded by GPS, and the traces are triggered about three times per second at a tow speed of around five kilometers per hour. This is a 250 megahertz antenna that has sufficient depth of investigation to image into the lake sediments where the ice is frozen to the bed. In this case, we're interested to observe where the lake is frozen solid to the basal sediments and where there's ice floating on a deeper water column. In this annotated radargram, you can see the floating ice on the left side that is particularly characterized by a ringing of the GPR signal due to the multiple reflections between the air ice, and water interfaces. On the right side, you can see where the lake is much shallower and the ice is frozen solid to the underlying sandy shelf near the lake edge. In this case, we also see evidence of a seasonal freeze in the sub-lake sediments. There are also some reflections that are difficult to conclusively identify in the bottom right of the image. These may be sedimentary layers, or they might be related to a perennial thawed zone, also known as a talic. Unfortunately, the video I have available for this next example is low quality because it was all recorded in time lapse. But Dune GPR is a classic application, so I thought it would be useful to include it anyway. In this common offset cross section, you can clearly see the layering of the sand deposited by many wind events and now truncated at the top by wind erosion. Here's another example of a common shot gather measurement that we use to retrieve the velocity structure to assign the correct depths of the 2D images. Here again we move back to permafrost, and this time our objective is to image the thickness of the top layer of ground that thaws in the summer, known as the thaw depth, as well as to retrieve the water content averaged over the depth of the thawed layer. In this case, the saturated soil surface conditions and periodic rain events mean that we must protect the GPR antenna in this enclosure shown at the bottom of the screen. Here's an example of a typical radargram for this type of measurement with the permafrost table reflection indicated in green. For more information about these measurements and the results of the GPR thought up measurements, check out this paper published in the journal Geophysics. In this next example, we use 100 MHz GPR to map the depth of peatlands. For these relatively small peatlands, we can crisscross the surface and use statistical functions to estimate the total volume of below ground peat and related carbon stock. These example maps show the calculated peat thickness based on GPR measurements. While peatlands like these tend to form in topographic depressions, the shape of the depressions is unknown and unpredictable and therefore measurement is the only way to retrieve peat volume. So the uh, equipment you see behind me is a, a ground penetrating radar instrument and ground penetrating radar uses radio energy to uh, probe the subsurface and we can interpret how thick the peat is everywhere where we make a radar measurement. And it's a really quick way of measuring the peat thickness without having to directly put a probe in the ground. Um, so the, the ground penetrating radar geophysical measurement is, is important for science because it allows us to really quickly uh, measure the volume of peat in all of these peatlands with many hundreds or thousands of peat thickness measurements. Um, it also allows us to um, determine peat thickness and then decide where to core based on what we see the peat thickness is. So we can pick the best spot in the peatland to measure um, an extracted core from uh, really sort of quickly before we have to um, collect the core.
In this example, a team is working on a cinder cone volcano using GPR to gather information to study the geologic composition history of the cone and provide insight into processes that create cinder cones. Again, 100 megahertz unshielded GPR antenna are being used here. You can clearly see how the antennas are kept in close contact with the ground to maximize coupling and ensure the maximum amount of energy is passed into the subsurface. Here you can see a typical three-person team operating the GPR with a person to pull the antennas, a person minding the cables, and an operator for the computer. Often the computer is kept several meters away from the antennas to reduce the possibility of EM noise interference. Some of the data collected on this volcano showed evidence of small fault offsets. The top figure is just an annotated version of the bottom figure. You can see that the horizontal reflection patterns are discontinuous, which is interpreted as fault offset. Here's another example of a result showing how the cone deposits truncate against the older, horizontally layered deposits at the base of the slope. This example highlights the importance of correcting for topography in GPR data. The bottom image is the same as the top, but without the topographic correction, the reflector geometry is substantially skewed. It's about 48,000 right here. 